Welcome to Peoples and Things, where we explore human life with technology. I'm Lee Vinsel. Do you remember when Thomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century was published in English in 2014? That was a huge deal in the worlds of books and public ideas. Though let's be real, that was a book far more purchased than read. I think it was economist Deirdre McCloskey who first pointed out that according to Kindle or some other app, most readers did not make it more than 25 or 30 pages into the book before calling it quits. Still, though not read, the book was influential. Piketty argued that inequality, which had been increasing in many rich nations, but especially in the United States for decades, arose because larger returns went to capital and those that owned it then went to labor. Over time, this means a growing divide between the rich and the poor. Now, I agree with some philosophers and conservatives who argue that actually inequality itself is not what we most care about. What we most care about, or should at least, is how people at the bottom of the economic ladder are doing. But I think we have plenty of evidence to say they're not doing very well. And actually, Piketty's point is that in the context of such suffering, inequality breeds resentment and eventually social strife. And some argue that this is precisely what we see in the forms of populism that have emerged on both the left and right sides of the political spectrum. Piketty published his follow-up book, Capital and Ideology in English in 2020. There he argues that over time, societies have developed different sets of ideas and stories called ideologies that act as justifications for inequality and make it seem like a natural feature of the world instead of as the outcome of different choices that favor some people's fortunes over others. Well, if that's true, what is the ideology that justifies inequality in the United States and other nations today? For sure, there are many parts of it, but with a group of colleagues, today's guest, business professor Robert Eberhardt, has been arguing that a core aspect is the ideology of entrepreneurship, which suggests that people can become successful if they try hard enough, and that inequality is a natural outcome of entrepreneurial effort and value creation. Bob is an interesting guy. He was a businessman and successful entrepreneur before he decided to go back and get a PhD in organizational studies. When he got to school, he found that what academic scholars and business professors were saying about entrepreneurship and things like venture capital were totally out of whack with the way the world really worked. Now he has drawn together a group of scholars to examine the history of the entrepreneurship ideology and how it functions. One place they do this work is at the Reversing the Arrow Conference on Entrepreneurialism in Society, which I was lucky to attend in Lake Tahoe this summer. In this episode, Bob and I talk about his fascinating career and why he has now dedicated a good part of his life to taking on the ideology of entrepreneurship. We had a lot of fun together. Hey, get excited. Bob, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Hey, good morning, and uh, it's wonderful, and thank you for the privilege and the opportunity of speaking with you, and uh, as you know, I'm a great admirer of your work, too. Thanks, man. I thought we might start with your uh, your essay with Steve Barley and Andrew Nelson titled, Freedom is Just Another Word for Nothing Left to Lose, Entrepreneurialism and the Changing Nature of Employment Relations. So... Can you just say, you know, what's that essay about and what were you guys trying to do with it? Thanks. Um, Good question. It's a complex paper, but let me simplify it by just saying that the problem that was posed to, at least in my mind, that we had to figure out was about a proposition in California Mm -hmm. that was proposed for the voters to vote on that would make it 
um, legal to employ temporary workers um, uh, to employ workers as temporary workers and not give them the full benefits of uh, of employment. Mm-hmm. And that was proposed by the obviously by the uh, companies, uh, sharing companies who Uber and Lyft and others of their like, who wanted not to have to pay for vacations and insur- health insurance and, yeah. and have various regulations for their drivers. And again, it was no surprise to anyone, I think, that the uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce and uh, uh, various industry organizations were in favor of this. Of course it is. It would lower the costs for the uh, the companies. Mm-hmm. But it was a surprise to us that uh, certain otherwise left-leaning groups uh, came out in favor of it because of its emancipatory potential. And particularly that it seems that, although the data is mixed, but around 50 to 55 percent of Uber drivers themselves voted in favor of this. Wow. So the question was very simple. Why? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Why would you vote to lower your benefits and lower your pay? And that's when uh, uh, we started doing a lot of reading. And the thesis is it's because they view themselves as entrepreneurs. Hmm. And not as employees. That is that they're the norms they're following are those. Look, I'm I'm an entrepreneur. I'm an independent agent. I can work when I want. Um, and they're mm-hmm. accepting this emancipatory stuff. The problem that the paper addresses in that is that they don't get any. They get some of the downsides of entrepreneurship and almost none of the benefits. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, there's no way to go IPO with that. Um, they don't choose really uh, who they who works for them. They don't choose the corporate strategy. They don't choose um, the pricing structure. Almost none of the freedoms that are in entrepreneurship are in that arrangement. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And so the conclusion is that. Uh, that we are is that what we did was to explain this is update um, theories of from Bendix from the 60s that um, there are ideologies in the workplace that structure the relationships between the haves and the have nots. And the unique thing about this paper is that we argue that it's not the haves and haves nots, but who belongs inside an organization gaining benefits and who belongs outside of it to contract with different organizations and try mm-hmm. to gain, do the best they can. And so the thesis of this thing is that this new ideology has emerged to restructure relationships to actually create a sharper division between who has and who is not, largely based on organizational uh, beliefs. That's great. And part of the background that's in the paper is you, there's this earlier period you, you all call the age of security. Right. Um, which is, tell us a bit about that and how it kind right. of spells the background of the historical change. Right. And thanks for, for bringing, because that's a really important part of the paper is how this ideology evolved. And so that story is that evolution. Uh, what we're talking about is the post-war work arrangement that structured, and this was the Ben Dixie analysis, that structured the deal, the social contract that existed in American work. Mm-hmm. And that basically was that, you know, I will work for you as long as you pay me a wage that's reasonable. Um, I will be loyal to you in exchange for that wage and let you direct my work activities. Mm-hmm. Um, and the deal was two, th- was, was, basically had two aspects. First of all, just that contract. I'll keep my mouth shut if you pay me enough, you know, to just work for you. But much more important, there was this implied promise that if I was work hard enough and ambitious enough, there's a possibility for me to advance myself. Mm -hmm. So what this contract did in the 60s, you know, 50s and 60s, was it tempered social dissent, if you will, Mm -hmm. by, by, by co-opting, but through the promise of promotion, those ambitious and hardworking people um, mm-hmm. that might otherwise be dissenters. Um, now, this fell apart. This arrangement fell apart as the companies that could make that commitment disappeared in the, the crises of the 70s. Uh, I'm old enough to remember, and you're not, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the disruptions 
<clears throat> that happened in the early 70s, precipitated at least originally by the oil crises and the run-up mm -hmm. in oil prices. But much more important, I think, was the high inflation and relatively high unemployment that occurred at the same time in the early 70s. And it changed how people thought about the way the economy ought to work because it was properly perceived that those two conditions couldn't happen. Mm -hmm. You know, that we were going to get one or the other, but not both at the same time. So there was an exploration um, and I think it's one of those times, and I think we ought to write papers about this, it's one of those times where the populace and individuals start looking for new answers. Yep. And they found them in the current, um, growing in Chicago, mostly, uh, ideas of markets are the perfect solution to everything. That the Pareto optimality is where you get, and you can't do better than that, and markets are the solution. So that was reached out, and we got... Reagan and we've got, you know, all kinds of things happening that then it, then it resulted in a new way of thinking about how we exist in society in the work relationships. Mm -hmm. um, we took we disbanded the conglomerates, calling them inefficient. Uh, efficiency wasn't used as an argument for them in the 60s, but now all of a sudden they were inefficient. Yeah. Um, you know, the we. Uh, empowered financial financial actors to take over sell off you know put into bits um we worried about that a bit and the movie wall street is a statement of yeah. what you know um but nevertheless it proceeded and proceeded and finance became a much more important part and the clinton administration just really i think put the ice cream or the whipped cream on top of that Sunday by mm -hmm. dismantling many of the uh, depressionary controls on financial institutions uh, that restrain their behaviors. So yeah. what happened is um, that historical analysis is important because it tells you why a new work arrangement emerged. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're calling the entrepreneurial ideology. It says... That no longer that I make a social contract with you, you pay me and I work for you. But the social contract becomes um, I will I'm I took risk and I'm inside this organization and I deserve these benefits because I took that risk. Mm -hmm. You belong outside. You have to take a risk or become an entrepreneur yourself and create your own organization. Mm -hmm. But if you work hard and are ambitious enough, you'll cut will bring you inside or you'll be successful. Yeah. So we do the same thing. You have the same safety valve that tamps down descent, and so that historical dis that historical story is important. I think. Yeah, one of the ways you and I have talked about this uh, before that I find kind of helpful for framing it is, um, uh, you know, Thomas Piketty had capital in the 21st century. His first book that you know is all about why inequality works the way it does and has to do with returns to capital versus returns to labor. Uh, but then he has the second book, Capital and Ideology, which is really about how societies have to come up with, you know, these ideologies, which are justifications for inequalities. Right. And it's, so I think part of what I hear you saying is that in American society, uh, we might think about whether entrepreneurship is the only ideology. There's probably others, but it's a major ideology in that it's like justifying this inequality. Right. And making right. it seem natural. Right. I think that's. Thanks. And we did have talked about that. I think that's an essential part of our story. I think this is important. I'm going to be a little bit speculative here and I mm -hmm. hate to pull the tail of another of a historian. But um, the story of equality in the United States is a little bit di or actually quite a bit different from the story of equality in Europe, which Piketty was largely addressing. Mm -hmm. um, we have a belief, had a belief, I think, that equality was a. Uh, an ideal and an attainable ideal that, you know, uh, we were structure our society not to create egalitarian outcomes, but at least everyone had a chance at, you know, grabbing the, the brass ring and that it was better if we had a more egalitarian rather than a less egalitarian. And you could see this a lot <clears throat> from the yeah. mid 19th century through uh, 1980, universities, for example, um, Cornell prominently, but many of the land grants were formed in order to take 
um, less educated immigrant populations, you know, and bring them into um, the wor- the working elite. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were seen as equalizing forces. Yeah. Um, many think public education was viewed as I can bring people from all walks of life and all income levels and bring them into a common uh, community view of how we ought to operate in the social political sphere. Um, so there was, and America, <clears throat> as a particular thing for me, because I worked in Japan, um, Japan has this politeness, which is severe, um, based on your rank and your level and where your relationship is with other people. American yeah. politeness is quite different. Our politeness is to ensure that I don't think I'm better than you. We, our politeness is an equalizing thing. We say please and thank you to everybody, and it'd be rude if I said only to please to rich people and you know that kind <laughs> of thing. It's yeah. to show that we're no better than each other. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> What's interesting about that is that the financialization of the economy, we put this in the thing, is turned that almost topsy turvy. Um, universities now pride themselves on being mechanisms of elitism. They yeah. advertise yeah. how few people they admit. Yeah. Um, and call them and explicitly call them the elite. Um, we have, you know, a, there's now a belief that wealth confers expertise. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, and we admire that. And there's people who admire, rather than seeing the wealthy as robber barons and what are we going to do about them, we see them as that's what we ought to be and let's train our children to be like them. Yeah. And so what this gets connects to Piketty is precisely. Piketty's, I think, his second book, which I think is by far the most interesting one, argued that all societies have to have an explanation that's broadly accepted for why the in- observed inequalities um, happen in the, in their society. Mm-hmm. And he argued several different mechanisms in Europe. But what we're arguing is that in the financialization of the economy that occurred after 1980, we needed an explanation for what's becoming gross and very obvious inequality. Mm-hmm. And that explanation is something we call the entrepreneurial ideology. We're unequal because they took a risk. They were success. I just have to be um, work as hard as them and take as many risks. And eventually I'll get there. Can I say one thing about failure? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> failure is the key element to this ideology. We tell people. And this is what brought me into it. We tell entrepreneurial students, and you see this in the popular press, that it's okay to fail. Mm -hmm. That if you're going to be, all great entrepreneurs have failed many times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, You've heard that, and you've seen it on TV shows, and you've heard um, in classes. um, there was Failure is good. Yeah, failure is good, (laughs) actually. It teaches you stuff. Yeah. I was an entrepreneur before I was a scholar and failure is the last thing in the world I wanted to do. And and the and I was a VC too. <clears throat> the last thing I would want to hear about somebody proposing to me to me to give them 10 million dollars is that they felt it was okay to fail. Yeah. You know, not with my money it's not okay to fail. <laughs> What's go and what and then the third thing which I think is most important is that empirically it's just not true. I looked at all the major companies and who founded it and how many times they failed before they founded it and mm-hmm. it turned to be that number is pretty close to zero. So <laughs> um what so what's going on? And the answer is that this failure mechanism is one of the calming elements uh the socially calming elements of the entrepreneurial ideology. Because if you tell somebody that success is preceded by many failures, then mm-hmm. people can observe their own lives, say, look, I failed at these four things, so I must be on the path to success. So they don't make signs, they don't contribute to radical political things, they don't <laughs> yeah. march in the streets. And yeah. so this is a, a key thing that makes that embeds this ideology and provides the answer that Thomas Piketty uh, challenged us with. Yeah. I, I mean, I think the entrepreneurship ideology, I mean, I think it it misrepresents all kinds of things. Right. I mean, one of the things going on here, it, you know, I've seen I can't I always forget why I need to look it up again. It's either was in Forbes or Fortune, but there was this little article about like, how the most common denominator of or most common f- fact like feature of successful 
entrepreneurs was that they had rich parents, right? right? And so, so often the people who are doing this, you know, not obviously, not always, but mm -hmm. very often people have a strong kind of social safety net in their own personal network that allows them to take these risks, which you right. also talk about on your in your paper on failure. So, mm -hmm. I mean, but this is not a part of the entrepreneurial ideology, which is all about like how we're just taking risks together and we're all equals in this right. risk taking or something like right. that. Well, the, the ideological part of it is that uh, let me, can I take one yeah. step backwards? Yeah. First of all, I don't want to give the impression I'm against entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, I mean, I was an entrepreneur. Um, yeah. I want to talk to you about that. So right, yeah. we'll, we'll get there in a minute, but <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and frankly, it, they perform a vi entrepreneurial firms perform a vital function in mm -hmm. a healthy economy. I think a balanced um, contribution that said, <clears throat> What has emerged is a new view of entrepreneurship separated from this kind of idea of a commercial organization creating a profit yeah. into a set of what how we ought to do things. And let's take this thing you talk about, the social safety net. It is certainly true that the wealthy more likely found companies companies and it's because they have a safety net. They don't have they're not spending their life savings. Mm -hmm. uh, on this thing. And good entrepreneurs don't spend their life savings. This is very important to understand the story of Silicon Valley, though. Silicon Valley in the 90s was a very much a hotbed of entrepreneurship, although not by as many as, many as people think. But in Silicon Valley in the 90s, and I observed this directly, you could literally print your resume walk across the street and say, I'm tired of that place, I want to work here. And they would say, yeah, come on in. There was so much need for mm. college-educated talent in, in this area that it was just incredible. And so someone could start a company, try it for two years, you know, and then it doesn't work, go back to work. Mm -hmm. That's become reinterpreted in modern ideologies when we think about it as explaining inequality is that failure will result in your ability to try again mm -hmm. and ask in the paper with what i mean unless you are wealthy you know I mean? right right <laughs> <laughs> and and what's worse it is absolutely true that you know a wealthy kid whose parents are you know bankers or whatever they are um, to lose twenty thousand dollars on a thing, no big deal. Yeah. But if you take a young kid in Detroit who's trying desperately to get out of poverty, scratches together twenty thousand dollars to start a, a small company, and it doesn't work. Yeah. That's he's never going to get up again. Mm -hmm. And the that's the problem with the justification okay. of you know uh, sometimes social mobility through entrepreneurship because it's hard to think. <laughs> of a social program that gives you 90% chance of failure in calling it a success. Yep. So I want to give listeners a sense of your your life and career a bit and you know why you care about these things. So am I right that you grew up you mostly grew up in Michigan? Thanks. I grew up in southern Michigan. Um <clears throat> we moved around a lot, but basically in small towns. Uh although I was born in Detroit of all weird things. Mm -hmm. And um and grew up in I'd call middle American boring communities. Um, you know, there was uh, a satellite of McDonald's and, um, you know, uh, Long John Silver's at the at near the interstate. Um, and, uh, you know, old houses that were built during railroad era and okay. automotive area. And all the companies in town were automotive parts suppliers. Okay. Um, so if you've ever read Kurt Vonnegut's Breakfast of Champions, you get a pretty good idea of where I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, and much of the zeitgeist of it. So, um, yeah. So, no, I grew up in southern Michigan um, and uh, <clears throat> grateful that I had a chance. Um, but notice that those towns, my town in particular, when I graduated from high school, it had 60,000 people in it. Mm -hmm. and now it's 28,000. Yeah. And of the five uh, companies that were there who were the employers of the town, mm -hmm. uh, all of them are gone. Wow. Um, and I remember being in, in graduating college and I was working at General Motors Oldsmobile and General, General, Oldsmobile, General Motors began massive layoffs. 
Um, and, you know, my girlfriend lived in Flint, Michigan, and that town was just torn apart. I mean, yeah, torn apart almost. And, you know, I can't imagine that a war would have more economic damage than what General Motors uh, and Ford did in uh, Michigan in uh, the in the early 80s. So yeah. it that informs much of my research. Yep, for sure. Uh, just that living through and the importance of communities and employment and why we actually support having industrial development at all. And it's not to make people get IPOs. It's so that communities can thrive. Mm -hmm. And so then you became, you were a businessman. You worked in a, a big company for a while and then you became an entrepreneur, right? Right. Well, <clears throat> yeah, I got very lucky. Um, I moved to, uh, um, when I graduated and my wife finished dental school, um, we decided actually put a map on the kitchen table and <laughs> with tins started evaluating where we wanted to live and, and work and picked, I, I visited California when I was 30 years old and I visited California for the first time. First time I'd ever been West of Chicago. It was kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I just, came home and called my wife, I remember, and said, we're moving. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we ended up uh, moving to a college town, Palo Alto, because we like college towns. And um, <clears throat> got a job in the semiconductor business and uh, did reasonably well. Uh, was recruited kind of like almost a standard story. Work at a place two or three years. You get promoted and recruited to another place and you go there. Um, and ended up <clears throat> as an executive um, at, a, at a large company that produced telephones and headsets and that kind of thing, uh -huh. uh, and ended up as the president of their branch in Japan because I had um, absolutely serendipitously learned Japanese when I was in college. Huh. Wow. <laughs> wow. I didn't know that part of the story. That's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's always Japanese stuff around my house because my parents were married in Japan. And okay. uh, so they had little decorations and stuff. And when I was in college, Japan was the China of the day. It was. Yeah, know, yeah, totally. You know, everything was happening. Yeah. So anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah, I ended up as the president of uh, the subsidiary, the Japanese subsidiary of this company. And uh, it was at that time that when I was, I was distributing electronics, um, I noticed the distribution laws had just changed in Japan and radically um, mm -hmm. that all kinds of new arrangements being made between jobbers and middlemen and wholesaling and retailing. All that stuff was just in a tizzy. And I thought that <clears throat> whenever you get those things to rearrange themselves, mm -hmm. um, somebody's going to make a lot of money. And I just figured that might as well be me. And so we, <laughs> 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 so I made a list of 23 different products that I thought bringing into the country would be uh, good business opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I just put them on a big spreadsheet and did a bunch, measured them with a bunch of dimensions, like, the price and how we move it, what the taxes are, how fast the market was growing, you know, um, yaddy who. So I made this spreadsheet of 23 different products that I thought would be good candidates to import into Japan and just spread that against the market growth rate, the prices, um, custom duties, transportation, yaddy who, distribution networks, whatever, <clears throat> and just evaluated them. It did something that I tell my students of entrepreneurship to never do. Um, I picked wine as the best thing in terms of growth rates and everything else and said, I'll do that. And why I think that's a stupid thing to do is I knew absolutely nothing about the wine business. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> when you talk about entrepreneurship, you always talk about being an expert in the market, and exactly. you were not really no, that. <laughs> that's why I always talk about it. Because it was like the dumbest move I'd ever done. And found that out the first time I called a winery to ask if I could buy their wine. Uh huh. Um, you know, because their thing was they said, Who are you? And I told them, they said, what company you're with? And I told them, and they said, how long have you been in the wine business? And I said, I'm just starting. And they said, don't you ever call this number again. And if you do, I'll sue you. It was just like that. Wow. <laughs> <You know? laughs> They're not into entrepreneurship, yeah. I guess. <laughs> right. I'm not getting the door slammed in your face. And that happened uh -huh. quite a bit. 
I found uh, out later why. But um, <clears throat> I called a friend of mine who's a headhunter and said, um, look, we need somebody on the inside of this business. It's clearly, a, you know, it's quite insular. And he did find us the best person in the known universe huh. um, to join us. Um, a wonderful man named Dick Marr, um, who was probably his nature be given by his that he has an MBA from Stanford and he was a captain in the Marines. Hmm. And uh, he was the he sat on 23 winery boards. He was the founder of the Napa Valley Vintners Association. He was oh, the founder wow. of Cal Finder Wine Institute. You know, he was the president of, been the president of Christian Brothers, been the president of Behringer. Yeah, I just, you know, yeah, yeah. came up through Gallo, which is the Marine Corps of the wine business. And, uh, you know, so <clears throat> he was wonderful and agreed to join us uh, as the chairman of the board. And uh, that that's really got us a supply thing. Then selling it wasn't hard um, because we designed a, or at least I did designed a very technically based um, inventory and throughput system, which we can go over on a different broadcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, we were, we, our costs were about 30, 40% lower than our competitors. So we undercut the market and still we're making more money than them. And uh, we grew and grew. So I was very pleased. It was a Janus-like experience. We had the American side buying and sourcing line. And we had a Japanese side being very traditional selling line. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, we grew and grew. And I was very pleased. We had, we had venture capital investments from Japanese VCs. Wow. Uh, went through four rounds. We acquired a company. We had tons of heartache. Um, you know, and a lot of this and and eventually sold the company uh, for profit. <clears throat> a lot of this stuff informs what I teach about entrepreneurship. The story of Dick Mars spent time on because you can't underestimate the importance of social networks you have. Yeah, exactly. When you're trying to do things as an entrepreneur. It's one of the things this is not the realm of a 22 year old. Yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> this is a realm of a 40 year old. Yeah, you, you know people you can call, yeah. um, and I can go into, and I should if we have a minute. Yeah, um, the another you know just a related. Incident. Yeah, go for it, man. Yeah, <clears throat> we needed a license to import wine, mm -hmm. so we talked to the Japanese government, um, and they said, "Oh, no problem. Fill out this form, you know, and we go through our process." And I go, "How long's the process?" And they said, 15 years." <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> People complain about bureaucracy here, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, so it was that was kind of an unpleasant answer. So um <clears throat> I called my attorney who we had picked and just still a great friend. And uh she said, Well, you know, it just happens, and my father is the friends of the head of the national tax office. So I'll talk. And Japan's not a corrupt country. It's not that we can rear payment. But he called us back and said, you know what? There's a new law they just passed. They're trying to get new entrepreneurial companies to start more so we can use that law to get you in. And 40 days later. Wow. <laughs> and it just goes to the point of yeah. social connections and the depth of them. You know, uh, that is, to me, just the most important thing. If I can learn two things about entrepreneurship when I teach them, number one, expertise in the market. Don't make the mistake I made. And number two, the depth of your social network uh, and the intelligence of using it are going to be the important things for success. Yeah, and exactly. And, and, you know, just as you kind of alluded to, we we know from a number of studies that most successful entrepreneurs are over the age of 40. Right. They're not coming right out of college. It's not right. Shark Tank crap. That's um, right. <laughs> and, and so and it's for this very reason, right? It's because about right. expertise in a market uh, and, and social networks. And right. That's it's why also, this works. There's also a mischaracterization many times of entrepreneurship. Nobody considered my company a high tech company because we were selling wine. Yeah. There was a tons of high tech in the way we sold it and the way we moved inventory. I mean, yeah. you know, sophisticated stuff. But nobody considered it. And so we wouldn't be considered a true entrepreneur. Same thing in uh, my wife's a dentist. Mm -hmm. 
She started the company. She leased the building. She decided what services she can provide. She does the pricing. She hires the people. She does all the marketing. She's not considered yeah. an entrepreneur in many realms. By yeah, many yeah. People. <clears throat> and so it goes to how, you know, just the general lesson that what we think of as an entrepreneurship today is not probably what we, the way we thought about it 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and it's got elements of what, activities you're allowed to do yep you know and so it's it's a fascinating thing to i think entrepreneurship scholars have yet to fully grapple with Mm -hmm. some are starting howard aldrich in particular so you cashed out of this business you started and what man what led you to want to get a phd at that point that's not like i think i would have i don't know (laughs) i'm still trying to decide if that was a good move or not (laughs) uh interestingly enough um i was a, a phd student when i was very young um i was uh i was a manufacturing guy I'd mm-hmm. worked in Oldsmobile and in steel and in iron foundries and just loved manufacturing. And after college, I got a job at a commercial bank and wore a suit and uh, drank Manhattans and whatever else it is you do and that kind of thing. And I just despised the work. Mm-hmm. Um, I just really, really did. And um, I'm not saying it was anything bad about it. I, just, I didn't like it. Mm-hmm. And so... Many of my professors at my undergraduate thing had urged me to get a PhD, which at the time seemed like an insult because, like, they're trying to make me take more math classes. <laughs> and, <laughs> but, you know, I know. And so, yeah, I applied and got into University of Michigan in the economics PhD program. Huh. Um, we, well, I took a delay of a couple years with the permission of my advisors uh, because my wife had a, uh, and I had a baby. I guess we did that together. And um, <laughs> um, he's a doctor now, so it worked out well. Um, but um, the uh, <clears throat> that two years hiatus while I took care of the baby and she finished her dental education uh, turned into 20 years work. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> money's tempting. <laughs> and, uh, so um, it was when I sold my company and had to decide what to do next I really did tell my wife, I want to go do what I want to do now rather than yeah. what other people want me to do. And so in a process that sounds simple but was fraught with difficulty and woe, um, eventually ended up with my Ph.D. when I was 53 years old. Mm-hmm. And so I remember you saying a big part of what got you going on this work on entrepreneurialism is that you were – you know, you were in your PhD program and you were reading pieces written by academics about entrepreneurship and venture capital and related topics. And you just couldn't believe your eyes. Right. Is totally that basically right. Like, yeah, no, it was shocking. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's uh, one of the main things and I'd probably going to get in a lot of trouble for this because I, but I already have, um, <laughs> is this idea that entrepreneurs, what they do is gather resources. What? You know, entrepreneurs pursue market opportunities. They're good perceptors of what the market is doing and what people want Mm -hmm. and, you know, figuring out how to extract money out of that. You figure that out. People are going to throw resources at you. The almost the last thing I worried about as an entrepreneur was how am I going to get my next venture capital around and how are we going to finance this? The first I worried about that after we had the sales going. Mm -hmm. all of a sudden we need a lot of money to support the sales okay how do we do that Mm -hmm. you know and then the attention turns to um, resources so kind of that whole emphasis on resources at to the exclusion of figuring out what's going in the market and being perceptive about it's a good lesson i give my students i at least i think it's a good lesson when i give them the story of uh, uh, Leland Stanford and uh, it, they I tell them that he came to California in 48 you know and became the wealthiest man in California he did you know what business was he in and everybody says oh it must have been the gold business he must have struck a rich and I tell them no he owned a hardware store 
Yeah. He sold <laughs> shovels. Yeah. <laughs> he let all you guys go dig for gold. Yeah. <laughs> and in the second thing, and in just another example of the classroom, I ask everyone what kind of company they want to start. And you know, you've seen these things happen. 80%, 90% of them, it's some sort of app. Yeah. Usually in exchanging information. I write that stuff down. And then I ask the class, is there any entrepreneur in this room? And they look around like they think they all are. You know, and I said, if there's an entrepreneur, tell me what we just learned. And rarely, I've only once in 10 years had somebody get it right. Then the point, then I have to tell them. I said, 85% of this people room are building an app. What do they need? You have to think as an entrepreneur. Oh, yeah. I What's see. the right. market? <laughs> right. What is everybody doing? Yeah. You know? <laughs> How can I provision these folks? Yeah. And yeah. I'm sure you had an aha moment with that. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, it, but that's, we don't actually teach that. Yeah. At least, you know, it, it, at least not very frequently. And mm -hmm. and the other thing that bugged me, having been a VC, is that how the VC is there to help you and guide you along. No, he's not. <laughs> or she's not. You know, just, you know, they're financial intermediaries. They need to make a buck. Your yeah. interests are not the same. You can use them for sure, and they have uses. They can use you and will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's <clears throat> this idea. When I was in the firm anyway, if we went out to guide a company, that's because we had a meeting the week before that they were in trouble, and we better start holding their hands because we're mm -hmm. going to have to sell them off. You know, yeah. the ideal company came in once a year, told us, showed us their great results, and then went back to work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so how did, how did you, I mean, did you pretty quickly in, while you're working on your PhD, realize you wanted to start working on the entrepreneurialism, you know, I, entrepreneurship, the ideology thereof, or, or no, did that come that, later? No, that, that I consider a gift of graduate education. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to say and give the impression that, the education I got was garbage. It wasn't. It just had a yeah. weird paradigm in some entrepreneurial studies. The stuff I was taught stunned me. It was a great way of, it was a new, terrific, carefully thought out way of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. um, I was instantly attracted to uh, institutional theory, organization theory, because that emphasis on social relationships mm -hmm. was what I actually saw in the world of work, mm -hmm. you know, and the biggest issue about being a CEO was conformity and social relationships and how do you make action seem legit legitimate and all these things. Yeah. So that was attractive and learning that was a revelation. Mm -hmm. So it moved me from when I started as an advocate of entrepreneurship and why don't we teach it right, you know, to why don't we think more carefully and deeply about what this entrepreneurship whole as a phenomenon is doing. And yeah. uh, that ideology came out in a, uh, in Woody Powell's backyard over uh -huh. with Steve Barley. And, you know, just, uh, I think the wine helped. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard rumors of this uh, hangout, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it just helped. And it came out then. So it was at, it was the result of my experience interacting with the fantastic education I received, mm -hmm. uh, particularly from my advisors, Kathy Eisenhart and Chuck Easley, who just, and Woody was around a lot, who just were incredibly generous and helpful and helped me uh, think about stuff carefully. I want to ask you about a couple of more of your papers, but, you know, I was going to say this to the end, but I feel like, why don't we just get, kind of go there now? Okay. Uh, um, so, um, you know, one of, you've kind of built a whole project around the study of the entrepreneurship, of the, 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 the ideology of entrepreneurship right. at this point. So why don't we talk a bit about that? Why don't we talk about the reversing the arrow conference and how you've kind of okay. organized, you know, a whole undertaking around this at this okay. point? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Uh, the 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 project evolved because the idea seemed to gain traction pretty quickly uh, with pretty much the right group of people. Is probably the right way to say it. Um, the people who I admired, Vilain Rondova, um, you know, uh, boy, uh, Diane Burton, um, just 
I, I you know, Steve Bar, all these Michael Owens were all these people were just mm-hmm. Jerry Davis were just jumping and saying this is right. We ought to think about this more. Yeah. Um, and because it was pretty new, and there's an old rule in academics: never come up with something really new. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, because it was new, there were no conferences that addressed it. Mm-hmm. And what's worse for me is I wasn't being invited to, wasn't being invited to anybody else's conference because of that. And so <laughs> <laughs> there's an old rule that I learned in high school. Um, I don't know about you, but I was not part of the popular crowd. And uh, a friend of mine, we were on the debate team, which is not a popular thing to do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. <laughs> a friend of mine said, um, um, we're not part of the popular crowd. I said, we should just redefine the paradigm. Let's declare us as the popular people and exclude them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so this is kind of what we did. The idea of the conference was, let's create our own thing. Um, decide to get like-minded people together and not, but also diversity of thought mm-hmm. um, and start talking about this stuff. And there was a very deliberate plan to frame the argument first. And Mike Lounsbury was very generous and others in giving us the opportunity through an RSO vo- set of vi- a couple of volumes to Discuss at the conference that we meet at Lake Tahoe. We set Lake Tahoe just because it's pretty nice to go to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we we published this as the stake in the ground. Mm-hmm. Here's the ideas we want to explore. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we are now evolving the conference into taking these ideas and the people who participated. And how do we... Uh, create empirical studies? How do we go about proving this? How do Mm -hmm. we extend this into other related fields? Uh, Two things about the conference, and I think you saw this when you were there, is we are ecumenical in terms of the paradigms we welcome into it. Um, We have people Mm -hmm. from strategy, history. um, Yeah, historians even. (laughs) Yeah, um, or or theory, all that. Yeah, Um, And we're non-hierarchical. There's no mm-hmm. difference between junior and senior scholars and PhD students. You know, if you have a good idea to contribute, um, you know, you're in. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I'm a pilot and people a long time ask me, how do you get involved in aviation? I said, that's a great thing about aviation. You just have an interest in flying, mm-hmm. you know, and, and then you're part of the crowd. So um, we're trying to set it up that way. And I'm pleased and very happy that um, and very complimented and incredibly humbled that um, the people like you that we've attracted to this um, uh, find it worthwhile of academic attention. Um, And uh, I think we're getting a very generative set of ideas that are starting to come out. There's been a PhD program in Europe started around it. Wow. Um, Yeah. I mean, I can't get over that to tell you the truth. Um, Where, you know, books are being written. Uh, We have the next two conferences are um, set in Colorado and in Banff. Uh, we we certainly will be going to Europe. There are streams in Egos and at AOM. We had the most uh, one of the most attended PDWs last year at AOM. So it just seems to have struck a nerve for some brave people. And um, yeah, you know, um, I'm very humbled by that uh mm-hmm. it doesn't make me an easiest fit in an academic department but you know mm-hmm. <laughs> um well you know i'm not, i'll just keep going along this one yeah. you, you you're you're doing some work with andrew nelson right now is right. that are you doing so you guys are looking at language and how concept has changed around this is well, that part of what you're looking right. at this is the kind of idea that we have to okay we said the idea now we got to prove it yeah and so there's uh, Andrew and I uh, are recently writing a book um, pitched at the popular level or learned mm-hmm. popular level. Um, and yeah, it's it goes very much, look, we have these ideas. Can we now observe and find these historical threads that we've wanted to see or, yeah. or that we're claiming exist? And so... We're not saying whether we can yet or not. We think it's likely. Yeah. Um, but we've done this with two empirical efforts. One is I got all the Washington Posts from way back when. 
and we're applying large language models to seeing how that conversation um, evolves over time. And there are some things <clears throat> we concur with lots of other data and lots of other papers that something really did happen in 1980, or mm -hmm. right around that. And you just see tons of conversations change. Interesting. Right in that area. And so mm -hmm. if it, I don't know how people are going to explain how societies can are very stable and then all of a sudden move. Um, you know, but yeah. Yeah, so we certainly found that. We also found just other things right now, and this is just frequency analysis. But, you know, in the past, you would laud people, uh, managers, because they were organizers. They had great ability to organize things and construct organizations yep. that worked. Now we laud them because they are risky and wealthy. It's a, it's a different sort of way of looking at stuff. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, there's just lots of stuff. So that's the kind of historical. In addition, um, we're working with the U.S. Census to get data on temporary work in every county of the United States over the last 50 years or so. Hmm. And we tend to create a hope to find patterns of temporary work where entrepreneurialism, broadly defined, but also we're developing metrics for that. Um, hmm. take hold and grow. And we'd like to see if that temporary and contract work is associated with entrepreneurialism. Huh. Or oh, different interesting. Industries, that kind of thing. So yeah. the discourse and the frequency are the kind of the key elements that will make this work, I think, be a, a you know, a more definitive and positive, positive statement about mm -hmm. what's going on. Cool, man. So, you also wrote this neat paper on Japan with some colleagues uh, titled The Legacy of the Samurai, How Conflict Between Shareholder and Stakeholder Logics and Communities Affect Ventures. So tell us a little bit about this paper and, you know, how did, what's it teaches about entrepreneurship and values, for instance, because I think there's a lot there it does. Thank you. I really appreciate it. This paper has gotten a lot of very positive reviews. Although it teaches me more than anything else how difficult it is to get a paper published. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, interesting enough, this goes back to our earlier conversation. All of my papers come out of a personal experience. Uh, somebody asked me once, how do I come up with the ideas? And I said, it's simple. I go back to a board meeting or growing up or something. <laughs> but, anyway, mm -hmm. um, but this is for sure. Uh, when I grew up in southern Michigan, particularly after the General Motors debacle, the advertisements and the whole justification for bringing in a new company were the jobs it provided. Mm -hmm. You know, just new factory coming, 5,000 jobs, you know. Um, yeah. And then they'd have a picture of the governor. Um, and it, it was right. Then I come to Silicon Valley to work and live and love it here. Um all the advertisements are about IPOs, yeah, and mergers and and stuff like that. And it always stuck back in my mind um, that we have, in particular, in the literature, we have this literature that firms deeply embedded in a community don't perform as well. Hmm. And the egg and the explanation being that they're constrained because their social networks in this community wall off opportunities and make it hard to find distant resources. Hmm. Well, OK, doesn't seem very smart to me because everybody was telling me at the time that it doesn't matter where you start your company, the, the Internet you know, gets rid of all barriers. You know, you can be in a, in a cabin in Colorado and put together a manufacturing thing and make uh, sneakers and, you know, that, yeah. that smell bad and, you know, make them in China and do everything. And, you know, banks are all online. The, the, the arguments didn't make much sense in terms of walling off resources. Yeah. And in the modern era where communication is everywhere, I think somebody in Indiana has roughly the same information content as someone in Silicon Valley. The difference of being the friends you have, and that was the key. Mm -hmm. um, so the proposal in the story, and we were just shocked when it worked out this way empirically, um, that companies that have a great deal of social connectedness to their community will not have the same objectives as a company isolated from the community in sort of a financialized era. Yeah. 
And as it turns out, we just just thought about it and said, okay, well, if that's the case, if we take the same kind of company, started with the same amount of capital in the same year, the only difference is one is deeply connected to the community and one is not deeply connected to the community, then the one deeply connected should employ more people and the one non-connected should likely grow faster mm-hmm. because they're making different choices internally. Um, and I said, the only, and how do we distinguish this from just a difference of resources that, that move those choices is if the ones in the community are lasting longer because if they're lasting longer than they're generating the cash they need, you know, even though they're employing more, which the ones yeah. who are disconnected would say is a suboptimal choice. Mm-hmm. So we found all that. So I'm just excited because it makes the point, and I hope it doesn't, this is how it connects, is that entrepreneurship ultimately as a benefit is not to make a few people wealthy, but to enhance the coherence of the community and the sense of economic security. Mm-hmm. I'm totally convinced, and I think this paper goes to that, I'm totally convinced that in the United States, one of the reasons for political discord is the economic insecurity that has become endemic um, as we change, as we move our social relationships from helping each other to helping ourselves. Yeah, and what what was attractive about uh, using a Japanese, I mean, using Japan as a, I mean, like, so there's a couple things going on, right? First of all, you had a nice data set, it looked like. Right. And, and, but also, what is it about values? Is that, was, was that your hypothesis or going in or what were you well, thinking? It's, it's two things. Uh, yes, one major reason is I had the data. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, but uh, no, the real thing is that, um, Japan, particularly Tokyo, which is where we focused it, has a unique layers of of beliefs, of social beliefs. So you have this kind of traditional Japanese thing going on, which is very communitarian. Um, you know, there's lots of work showing how Japanese large corporations will, when challenged, will give up um, profit in order to preserve employment. It's almost unheard of in the United States. Yeah. Um, you know, and there are, there's, it, it goes back to way traditions, kind of the tradition of agricultural cooperatives that would take, which would tax farmers who were doing well and help farmers that were not doing well. And, you know, uh, in order to create the idea is that business is there to make the community thrive. Mm-hmm. Now, after World War II, um, there was an increasingly, although not because of it, just uh, it was because of growth policies after the Americans left, um, increasingly and particularly accelerating after 1980 in Japan, too, um, the idea of uh, stakeholder capitalism um, became much more prominent, largely, I think, because uh, uh, finance invaded there, too. Yeah. You know, I mean, Japan's economy is fundamentally no different than ours. Um, and uh, uh, and so the same financial institutions and norms started coming in. So Tokyo became a place of banks and lawyers and hedge funds and that kind of thing. And the companies that started tried to, you know, and did successfully. I and mean, we all know Rock 10 and DNA and others that started as technology companies and you know, went to big IBOs and made people wealthy. So you had this sort of Western new economy, if you will, layered on top of, it's probably a bad metaphor, but let's go with it. Yeah. You know, later on top of or coexisting with uh, the Japanese. And so the reason for this is that here's where we will find if these local connections will interpenetrate this, um, this overlaying Western beliefs mm-hmm. and then reattach to uh, underlying uh, Japanese communitarian beliefs. So it was picked partially because we had the data, but mostly because it gave us the theoretical um, uh, purchase that we wanted. Yep. Um, I wanted to talk to you about at least one more paper, and this one totally fascinated me. Uh, 
It's called Certification Relics. Entrepreneurship mm-hmm. emits discontinued certifications. Mm-hmm. And I get it. I get excited whenever standards and certifications uh, come up anyway. But uh, <laughs> you also wrote with Daniel Armanios, uh, yeah. who was a former guest on the, he was a guest earlier on this show. He was, wow. he talked about infrastructure and inequality and race yep. and that yep. side of, uh, so yeah. that was exciting too. So yeah, tell, I have a, I have a couple of questions about for you about this paper, but just tell us, give, give us the gist. Sure. Thanks. Um, this, uh, again, came from experience. Um <clears throat> I was running a company in Japan, and when in 2003, I remember my lawyer called us up and said, hey, you can adopt this new corporate form if you want. And I asked her, you know, what's the advantages of that? And we had a discussion, and I can't remember what we did. I think we said no. But anyway, it was intriguing to me that no one, I, the form was that Japan trying to encourage startups mm-hmm. um, decided that their uh, minimum capital requirement to start a regular corporation, a stock issuing corporation, was some hundred thousand uh, dollars, which is not a small amount of money. Mm-hmm. And they said, "Look, let's change that because we think we're discouraging people, and let's make it just one yen." Mm-hmm. In other words, from something to absolutely nothing. Um, and as it turns out, I remember from being there that nobody did that. Right. <laughs> and the reason they didn't do it is because when I went to the bank and said, I would like some capital, I would like some loans. And they say, what's your capital? And if my answer is one yen, I'm not getting a loan. Right. <laughs> and so and so we just hypothesized that, you know, because of the legitimacy that's taken away when you're a one yen company. Um, but much more important, and we think more interesting about this, is that people that have a harder time starting a company anyway, and in Japan this would be uh, uh, women, hmm. you know, females are, I think, have an inappropriate and tough time in Japan, but that's beside the point. Um, start off with a legitimacy discount just in Japan. And mm-hmm. so the hypothesis was contrary to the popular idea that look if we make it easier we'll bring in other populations and equi- it will equilibrate we found that they were much more likely to stay with the high standard because they needed the legitimacy benefit right. of being there more right than others so we think that's kind of the clever thing about the paper um it's that we often ignore when we think about things to encourage entrepreneurship the social and legitimizing function of those well, uh, those regulations. And in fact, I made the point in another regulation paper is that we often forget in any regulation there's an advocate for it, and they probably had good reasons to advocate for it. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, so it becomes a kind of social signal, right, going right. along with the old rules, even if there's new rules. But, right. one of, but another another thing you point out in the paper is that you might play by the new rules if you have some other uh, r- resource of legitimacy, right. some right. other way to signal your legitimacy. Right. So because that's what to us made it a legi- told us and convinced us as a legitimate story. Because if you were had some other signal, say you were a top graduate of a top university, right? Um, you know, or you've had tons of experience in that industry. Uh, then, yeah. yeah, you can get away with being one yen company. Uh, you know, the intuition is really, really easy. If you Lee, walk into a VC and say, I want $5 million to make new, com- more comfortable heads, uh, a more robust uh, platform for my dis- <laughs> for my podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that doesn't keep crashing. <laughs> right. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I'll just laugh you out. Right, if right. If Bill Gates walks in and says the same words, he's going to get the money. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so we think that we contributed a better view of uh, the need, the legitimating function of regulations rather than the economic. It's cheaper, yeah. so more people will do it. No, it's cheaper. It's just like we saw. It's just like the gas station down at the corner changed its prices from five dollars to one cent, and everybody came up there and still paying five dollars. Yeah. Why would they do that? Yeah. And it has to be they have a reason, you know, and we provide that reason. It's you have yeah. the only way you want to do it is to show people that you're willing to do it. Mm-hmm. 
Or two. So, so what's next for you, man? You were working on this book with Nel- Andrew Nelson, and mm-hmm. uh, what else is going on? Well, I've got, um, I think, a nifty paper with Dan Armanos, who we were just talking about, uh, and a wonderful person um, over at George Washington and Vikram Bhargava. Uh, and we're, we're taking on this kind of observation. We took this observation of CEO pay. Um, all the finance people told us that, and finance people are very good and wise. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they got the, that there should be some positive relationship between the performance of a corporation and the pay of the CEO. Yeah. You know, the better the performance. And when we actually got the numbers and just did them, we found it was a normal curve which means that the highest performing companies were paying their CEOs as low as the lowest performing companies. And all the money was in the middle. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. Of performance. And so we have a paper that's now uh, an R and R at management science um, where we modeled this both in simulations and, uh, and found that and proposed the idea that luck is such a large part of the outcome Mm -hmm. that compensation committees can't trust the signal. If (laughs) if it's a big performance, they don't believe that. It was just like, (laughs) if it's a bad one, the CEO convinces them, ah, you know, that was just. Yeah. Yeah. That was a fluke. And what's happening is that when you go and want to get a new, a CEO, you don't want a superstar. You don't believe it. You know, you're not going to hire the bad ones. So you hire the good guy, just who's in the middle. You know, I want somebody who's going to run this company and have no disasters. And that's where yeah. the competition for money is going to be. Um, huh. So we've got that coming out, um, hopefully, this year. Um, then there, there's other stuff I'm doing with Gary Bruton on um, the ideologies of having to be entrepreneurs in post-colonial contexts. Oh, uh, yeah, good. Particularly post-slavery. Okay, um, and we want to understand if entrepreneurs are being held out as a equalizing influence, do they buy that? And, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, we're sort of and, and what results, and we're sort of in the middle of that. Um, I'm working with a, a number of other great people on a number of projects. George Foster at Stanford on a cool paper, I think, about um, how um, uh, managers interpret. Um, uh, bad news. <laughs> uh, so I'm trying to do in a lot of these papers, update knowledge in contrarian ways, uh, which makes me a provocateur of sorts, which I don't like. But I think I'm the only person who, one of the very few who's publishing in, in our journals, who was an entrepreneur, a successful mm-hmm. entrepreneur. And so if I can bring in perspective... That's what I want to bring. And, um, you know, hopefully uh, I'm not too nasty about it. Well, no, I don't think I haven't found you nasty yet at all, actually. Right. Um, but uh, but no, for me, it's been fun because, you know, I think you know, over I come from these STS and especially history of science and or, sorry, history of technology and business history worlds. And I think there's been people thinking about the you know, ideologies of innovation and entrepreneurship for a while, but it's been really just a joy for me to connect to these new communities. Like, you know, ending up in uh, this conference with a bunch of business school professors was not what I was thinking was going to happen. But, <laughs> you know, the conversations uh, have been really fascinating. So for me, it's been, well, it's been thanks. really great. Been, the, uh, it's been important because we've have, I at least I've taken up and the people that have influenced me have very much taken up that management scholarship our business scholarship world has not taken up, had not very well engaged uh, with the social issues of the day. Yeah. And that's not to say there's none. There's a really yeah. good and generative thing on grand challenges. Uh, but I'm more, I think we have not taken up how we socially interact with each other. What are the historic antecedents to that? Um, how does that mean? How can we be predictive? Because I think we had moved too much towards the uh, rationalist, um, dualist view of how people react rather than this social milieu, which I really think we exist in. Yeah. Um, You know, and so I think that's bringing people like you in who have your historical perspectives, which are fascinating. I just love your book. And um, 
renovation one. And, uh, you know, and I may love the other, but I'm just him running. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you know, that, to me, that's what's important and makes us real management scholars. We're not informing managers well. Yeah. If we tell them just rationalist things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That are not what they're going to confront in the world. Yep. So this is important to me for entrepreneurship education. Yep. If we're going to train people to be managers and entrepreneurs, we need to give them and, you know, we need to tell them the social elements they'll be facing and give them a sense of time and temporalness. And I've said this many, many times that, um, you know, it's great that most of our studies about entrepreneurship and how to do it are focused on the first six months of the company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The entrepreneur is going to be running for the next seven years. Right, right, right. <laughs> and mostly crying. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so yeah. we just have to be, and Andrew Nelson has done a wonderful addition to our special issue on this subject by talking about how we need more humanistic elements. And we need people like you in this thing, because one of the things that most profoundly affected me during my graduate education was Howard Aldrich saying, organization has no future because it has no past. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was just arguing we had not been attentive to how these things came to be that will help us understand what they are. Yeah. Well, Bob, thanks. I love the project, and you, you've drawn together a really cool group of people. So, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today, man. Oh man, we're you know, let's do it again sometime, uh, and over a glass of wine. That sounds great, man. All right, you take it easy, my friend. I hope you enjoyed this episode of our podcast. You can reach us with questions comments and suggestions at leevinsel at gmail.com or by following me on Twitter at STS underscore news or on YouTube at People's Things. Our podcast is distributed by the New Books Network, the leading platform for academic podcasts, so that you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Peoples and Things, like most things in this world, depends on the work of many people. I want to thank my brother Jake Vinsel for writing the music for the show. I want to thank my buddy Juliana Castro for designing the logos for the podcast. You can check out her work at julianacastro.co. Joe Fort is the producer for the podcast, and Mandy Lamb is the production assistant. This podcast and other Peoples and Things programming are produced in affiliation with Virginia Tech Publishing and supported by the Center for Humanities and the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. For information about other podcasts from Virginia Tech Publishing, visit publishing.vt.edu. For the entire Peoples and Things team, I am Lee Vinsel. And most importantly, I want to thank you for listening. Thanks.